Um, thank you, Gali, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here and to see so many parents and teachers and students and visitors here with us today. Uh, last November, when I was uh, speaking at a leadership conference in Qatar, somebody asked me afterwards, when did you know you wanted to become a leader? And though it's not a, a, a crazy question, it really threw me for a loop because I never planned on becoming a leader um, and I don't even necessarily know if I have become a leader. What I do know is that I decided to follow my passion and I decided to do everything I could to make that vision a uh, reality. And if in the process that happens to um, get people behind, rally people behind me, then that's, that's, that's wonderful and perhaps in that case, uh, I am a leader. But I think the important thing, the point, the point of my, my talk today is that you, being your age, you shouldn't be aspiring simply to be a leader. Okay, because um, too often we see empty leaders. A lot, of, uh, a lot of the politicians in so many countries these days that have chosen to become a leader when they're young and as a result they're merely intent on leading people and in many cases they don't really stand for, for something um, you know, strong enough or um, with enough integrity to really truly be effective leaders. Um, and so what I wanted to um, start with today is um, asking you to open your minds and follow your passion. Once you have opened your mind and you find out what it is you want to pursue, I think that it will be much easier to develop into the role of a leader if that's the way your path may, may go. Um, and as I said, don't chase leadership. Leadership is something that will happen if there's a reason for people to follow you. Okay? Um, and so in, in order to kind of um, encapsulate this, this lesson, I'm going to be speaking a little bit about, um, about my personal journey. But in, in doing so, I'm really hoping to present to you some, some directives and some pointers to help yourselves uh, develop your own leadership or perhaps just uh, find something that you're passionate about and, and pursue that. Um, so I'm going to go back to um, a moment when I really felt like I, I, I had a, a bit of a catharsis myself. Um, after studying cultural anthropology uh, in, in college, I decided that I wanted to kind of close the textbooks and really learn what was out there in the world waiting for me. I knew that there was uh, so many different places and countries that uh, I wanted to explore. And so my best friend and I bought a one-way ticket to China and spent about nine months traveling throughout Southeast Asia, East Asia, the Middle East. And the experiences that we had um, were really transformative. Uh, and there was one, one day in particular that I'll, that I'll never forget. We had been in, in Manila, in the Philippines, for a few days. And um, my, my friend asked me, well, what do you want to do today? And I said, well, you remember when we were driving in from the airport and we saw that like, shanty town, big place? I said, yeah. I said, I want to go there. And he said, you want to you go there? What's, what are you going to, what, what, why? What, what are you going to do there? I said, I don't know. There's, looked, it's a big place, looks like there might be 100,000 people living there. There's something going on. I'd like to just go see what it's like, go see how people are living. Um, and I said, I'm not really worried about, I'm gonna walk in there with $10 in my pocket and if somebody really needs that $10 more than me, well, you know, then they'll rob me, whatever. Uh, so I went in there, we went in, and the experience that I had there were amazing because these kids came up to me, you know, they could, they could tell I was out of place, but they, I said, hey, I'm just here to visit, I'm just here to take a look, whatever. And they were so friendly. We started playing basketball. We started, they, we had a lot in common. Um, they're, you know, in the Philippines, are tied into American culture a lot. So we started talking about NBA and Michael Jordan. We started talking about, you know, trading hip hop lyrics. And we just had a, had a great time. And I was just hanging out with these guys. Like they were, 
my friends, my brothers. And, you know, I remember at one point, I'm watching these guys run around the court. They're playing in those like flip-flop uh, sandals. And I, I asked them, I said, why are you guys, I mean, you're good, you're really good, you know, players. They were running circles around me. I said, but why are you guys playing in your flip-flops, you know? And he, he looked at me and he's like, well, we don't have any shoes. And I didn't really even believe it. I was like, well, shoot, shoot, you don't have any shoes you can play basketball on? And he looked at me and said, no, we don't, don't have any shoes. And right then at that moment, I realized that something was wrong, right? That it just was inherently unfair that these kids didn't have shoes. And I not only had 10 pairs of shoes back in my closet, but I had the privilege to get on an airplane and fly and visit, and visit these different places and everything. So um, I didn't, you know, I was only 21 years old at the time. Um, I didn't drop everything that I, that I had and start some, you know, school in the middle of this, in the middle of Shantytown. But it did plant a seed and I started to think to myself, hopefully down the road I can find a way to maybe kind of tip the scales a bit. Um, and so from there, I, as I continued to travel, I always looked for really immersive ways of travel um, and, and try to talk to people anywhere I could, whether they were the bus driver or whether they were the guy selling bananas or whether they were, you know, the, 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 the guy in the, in, the, in the favela, who knows. Um, the more I interacted with these people, I realized that, you know, this is the real um, takeaway from, from travel. I mean, five-star hotels are nice and fancy restaurants are nice, but that's a whole different mode of, of travel, right? Uh, so, you know, as I started to, to meet people, I really just, you know, I, I, pra I practiced empathy, just so we, we try to, um, you know, teach our, our students here, and that is put yourself in the position of those that you, that you come across. How would they feel if they were living? How would you feel if you were living in that situation? And if you were in that situation, how would you like to be helped, right? Um, so from there, um, I decided that I needed to, you know, apply myself. I needed to, I knew I wanted to do something in, in the field of, you know, international development. I wanted to find a way to be able to help these people. Um, I had no idea how. Uh, conventional wisdom, you know, told me that I should go back to graduate school, get my master's degree, study development, international relations. Um, so I did that in Washington, D.C., uh, which was amazing. You know, I, I learned so much through some really amazing professors that had a lot of real world experience. That was incredible. And I definitely recommend, you know, that, that experience. One of the most formative experiences of my, my two years in, in graduate school was when I was working with United Nations High Commission for Refugees, otherwise known as UNHCR. And we, as I was an intern, and as interns, we were encouraged to do some kind of, kind of independent project, which for most, of the, for most of them, it seemed like they would go to a high school and kind of give a talk and introduce what the UNHCR did and everything, which sounded okay, but I really wanted to kind of get out there. I wanted to push the envelope. I wanted to see how these refugees or how these people were living in real life. Um, and so I, I proposed to go down to Colombia. This is in uh, 99, 2000. So it was, there was still, you know, the, the Civil War was, was, there was still, you know, some conflict going on there. Um, and so I went down there and I did, did a, a study on how the internally displaced people were, were, were really, you know, living in, in some, some diff really difficult conditions. And what I realized on that trip was that there was a real gap in assistance there. There was a lot of, uh, a lot of need. And the UN, UN, based on their charter, could not uh, deliver that, that aid. It just, they just weren't really allowed to. And, but really what I learned is that there, there was another way, that um, there, there was a need there for, you know, between the big uh, multilateral organizations and the people on the ground. And that's kind of what I, what I wanted to fill. Um, and I didn't know how I was going to do that. I really had no idea. Um, so I started to kind of research, you know, thinking, all right, why reinvent the wheel? Maybe there's someone out there doing this kind of work already. And I came across a man named Mark Gold, who founded an organization called 100 Friends. Um, and, you know, this came from um, 
and Mark Gold had been doing this for, for a long time and I contacted him and introduced myself and you know this is what I'm, I want to do exactly what you've been doing you know is there any way I can help out work for you you know I'd love any, any help I can get um, and he invited me to, to meet up with him in, in, in Bangkok and I went out there to Thailand and, uh, and I met him and we, we really hit it off and he agreed that he would take me on kind of as a, men, as a mentor. And so for a year, he really, you know, taught me everything that he could. And this was such a formative experience. And it wouldn't have happened if I had not stepped forward and, and approached him, right? And that's, that's one of the important lessons here is that, um, you know, these things aren't going to fall into your lap. Uh, but when you find someone that is doing this kind of work or doing something that interests you, chances are they're going to want to help pass it forward and help the next person um, you know, reach that same reach, reach that same point. So um, once I once I you know started working with him, it really helped me kind of crystallize exactly what I wanted to do. Uh, then I realized that I needed to uh, I couldn't just start my own nonprofit because people didn't know my work. I needed experience also. So I decided to start small. And this is a this is a great lesson that, um, for anyone that is looking to you know get into some kind of leadership position. Or um, or whatever, and that is you know pick an, a small a, a attainable goal, which is important, right? I knew that I'm not going to overnight change the world, but I thought, okay, let me pick one situation, one place, and see what I can do, and then I can kind of go back, document it, go back to to everybody that's already helped me out, and show them what we were able to do. Um, and so this is a model that. To this day, to, to this day, it it, it, it works. Uh, for example, um, I put this page up here because when I was recently down in southern Africa, um, in Mozambique, I, I met a, an incredible girl who's interested in, in doing this kind of work too. And when she met me, she thought, "Oh man, I've been waiting to meet someone just like you. I really want to. I really want to really do this." And well, you know, I agreed to you know take her on and, and be her mentor, just like Mark Gold has been for me. Um, and you know, I'm really happy to report that in a few weeks she was able to. She and her friend were able to you know post this page on Just Giving, and they were, their goal was to raise money to build a water well for this this community, this community in Mozambique. Um, they raised so much money that they already built four, and I have plans to to do more work. So, um, you know, when you start small, then you can go back to, uh, you can document it, and you can show people exactly what you've been able to do, right? Um, so from there, the next step, you know, once you've gotten that small goal and you start to start to scale it up and think, okay, how can I really kind of tie this together? And, and for me, that was, the idea was to, to create my own nonprofit. Um, and in order to do that, I really had to come up with a plan. What's this going to look like? What, what, what's my mission statement going to be? How am I going to measure success? Um, and then, you know, what is, what is my, how am I going to kind of brand myself? How, what, what type of logo, what type of website? Um, and, and this here was, was uh, a great lesson because I realized that I really needed to make use of my friends, not just for their money, because my friends are by no means very wealthy, but more for their skills. You know, I mean, I have, for example, I have a friend who's a graphic designer, a web designer, um, and kind of social media expert. If I had gone to each of them and said, hey, this is something I'm really, really passionate about. Can you please, please, please donate $100? They, they would have donated $100. But instead, I said, hey, this is something I'm really passionate about. You're a graphic designer. You design websites. You do this. Can you help me out? And they jumped in and helped me out 100% over the course of weeks where if you had added up how many hours they put into it, it would have been so much more than $100, right? So that's a really valuable lesson is looking to, looking to utilize the natural skills or resources of people around you, okay? Um, and, and, you know, once we came up with our, our logo and our website and everything, we, I, I, I started to travel, um, paying for my own travel, but in my travels I would look for projects to help and uh, you know, really looking for the most hands-on way of, of providing whatever help they need. Um, I'd like you to take a look at this slide here. 
Um, and I'd like to ask you, which of these three, we have an iPhone, a PlayStation 4, and a baby that has gone through facial surgery. Which one of these three do you think does not belong? Uh, Sammy? The, the, the surgery. See? The surgery, right. The surgery does not belong. Obviously, it's not a technological gadget, but there's another reason, and that is financial. Okay. Um, which one of those do you think would be the most expensive one out of those? Which one do you think would be the most expensive? Uh, I think... Uh, surgery, the right? The surgery. The yeah, most people would assume, yeah, surgery is more expensive than, than, a, than a phone, right? Well, actually, it's not. Um, and I'd like to show you um, a video that's going to explain a little bit more about that. Unlike babies in the United States, whose cleft palates are usually surgically repaired at birth, many Guatemalan families cannot afford the simple surgery to repair their children's faces. Many of these kids go through life as social outcasts, and worse still, many die from malnutrition, as their deformed mouths make it much harder for them to breastfeed. Luckily, Cause and Effect was able to help three such children faced with this unfortunate fate. We paired up with a wonderful organization called Tess Unlimited, and with $600, financed the cleft palate surgeries for three needy children. We travel around uh, Guatemala to find all those babies with cleft lips and pellets. We're here at Obras Sociales, which is the local social welfare hospital, and uh, all of the families have come from different towns and parts of Guatemala in order to be evaluated by the doctors here. So our, um, our children have come from three different towns in Guatemala and right now they're being evaluated by the doctors to make sure that um, they meet all the criteria in order to be operated on. Okay, so this here is Zuleda and she's nine months old. And um, as you can see here, she's got a pretty serious cleft palate. And uh, so she's one of the babies that we're going to be operating on. Here in Guatemala, um, there are other issues, um, some of which relate to education. Uh, people aren't aware that something can be done. We would repair the lip portion of the cleft. Our first baby has just come out of surgery, and uh, so we are going to see the finished, finished product and see how she looks. Uh, the baby just come out of the surgery and looks wonderful, looks beautiful. Um, she's feeding, and everything is great. That video, it, it's hard for me, it's not hard for me, it's wonderful to watch that video. Um, and I, I want to cry every time I see it because it brings back amazing memories of these, these children. The children don't even really realize, these, these babies didn't maybe realize what was going on, but their parents did. And seeing parents get down on their knees and, 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 and weeping and, and, you know, praising God, and it's, it's a really powerful experience. Um, and the point here, as you could see from that video, is that for $200, we were able to completely transform these kids' lives, right? Um, these were children, some of them, these here are babies, but we've also worked with older kids, kids that are even teenagers, that have been shunned, that have been that really just kept in the house, 
Um, parents are ashamed of them. They don't understand and they don't have the, the $200 that they would need to, to conduct this surgery themselves. Um, and so being able to really just bring these kids, you know, really give them their life back for $200 is amazing. And, and you know, most people here have, have your, your, your $600 phones and that's fine. But, you know, keep in mind that for the price of one phone, you saw those three, you know, those three babies, what we were able to do. So um, that just kind of keeps things, keeps things in, in, in perspective. Students take note, a real leader would have had a better cameraman. Uh, but just to recap the last few minutes that were cut off um, of this speech, I impressed the students that they should focus on taking action instead of merely making plans. As they say, don't talk the talk if you can't walk the walk. I made it clear that they need to document their successes and not be afraid to share them to friends, coworkers, donors, or potential customers. Uh, and I used that YouTube video um, with all of its its views uh, that I've you know sent around with email and blog and everything as a way to raise money. Use that as an example of of how they can spread their their successes. And uh, since the current generation of students is more media savvy than ever, uh, this is a real advantage they need to exploit. Lastly, I circled back to my central theme. Uh, instead of focusing your life on how to become a leader, focus instead on following your heart and making others feel your passion. If you're worth following, they will follow. In the end, you may find that being a leader comes with more responsibility and or more satisfaction. That's up to you. But if it helps you advance your cause or your company or your ideas to change the world, then you've learned what true leadership is all about. Thank you.